Well, thank you so much for doing this. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited about learning about what you have to say. And I was thinking that what we could do is, well, we already discussed this before, but you can go ahead and maybe introduce yourself and then introduce your business. Let us know what the product is, what you sell, what it does, how it's going to help, you know, create more efficiency in healthcare. And then let's get into how this even came about. How did you start and what were some of the, well, We'll get into that later, but um, so yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, name's Alan Dow. Um, I guess the, the $1 tour of me is uh, actually started right out of high school in the military and went into a nuclear engineering program. And I was on a submarine after, after school, went on a submarine for about five years. Left there, went to a land-based nuclear prototype plant in upstate New York, and I taught engineering. Uh, did that for about four years, left and went to, uh, got picked up by General Electric doing in commercial power generation, gas turbine technology. And uh, I finished my MBA. I was traveling globally and domestic, uh, doing a lot of work in power plants and uh, wrapped up my MBA at General Electric. You know, they're dual doctorates sitting on each side of you. So I, I wanted to get a technical master's. I knew a doctorate wasn't the route that I wanted to go. And um, so I got into a program at Southern Polytech uh, as a master science program in quality engineering. And um, in that time, in that curriculum, we did deep dives into Malcolm Baldrige quality award criteria, which opened my eyes uh, a lot, ironically, a lot to how healthcare is broken. Malcolm Baldrige quality award criteria is a uh, quality management system award that's uh, given out by Congress every year to a service manufacturing and healthcare company. <clears throat> and so that piqued my interest into healthcare. I love to learn. I love trying new things. I can't sit still. Um, so I made a career jump to uh, healthcare, working for a company called HCA, Hospital Corporation of America. And I was a, got hired as a, a management engineer, kind of like an industrial engineer. They call them management engineers in healthcare. Uh, not everywhere, but um, no, I was predominantly focused on emergency services and our division was 14 hospitals, uh, acute care centers, and then the associated ambulatory footprint. And um, that's where I really learned healthcare. If you can imagine going from non-healthcare to healthcare, it'd be very intimidating. It's a different language. Uh, a, a silly story I like to share is, um, you know, in the engineering world, we don't wear acronyms after our name and our credentials, so it, it would look uh, pretty vain. But I, I can see why in healthcare you have to. And they asked me on the first day, I, I'd get my first hospital badge, and they're like, "What are your acronyms?" I'm like, "I don't want them." And she's like, "No, you need to have them." And so, uh, so I, I I did two years in that role. I had a lot of success, but the way that I learned and acclimated to healthcare, the quickest way for me to learn was just jump in the trenches with nurses. And so I would ask directors and CNOs if I could, in my division, if I could just go shadow a nurse and stand over them and ask them questions. And it was, it was really a lot of, why do you do that? And, um, you know, I always opened up with, I'm, I'm not here to audit or question what you're doing. I'm just trying to learn. I would purposely, I wouldn't wear a suit or a tie because they, they really wouldn't talk to you if you did. So I would, I would scrub in so it was easier for them to relate to me. And that was really eye-opening. If you really want to learn how the guts of a hospital work, um, scrub in and stand next to the people that are really running the business. So, so that's how I learned. And then I, I was promoted to um, the VP role and uh, for management engineering, which means I assume not only responsibility for surgical um, emergency services, but I assume responsibility for surgical services and uh, an $825 million labor budget. And I knew nothing about labor. So the first thing I did, the way that I learned the quickest is just jump in the trenches. So I called a meeting with all of my CNOs. They all came to Tallahassee, Florida. We sat around a round table and I just opened up with what's broke. And I didn't promise them any answers now, but I, I committed to getting back to them. I think that that's an important segue into what I'm doing now with Staff DX because it's, uh, it's health tech that's centered on the clinical leader. I always say money's not made in the boardroom. It's made in um, the individual departments of the hospital. 
And the leadership of those individual departments are by every financial definition, a CEO of a standalone multi-million dollar business. Um, and they, they don't have the tools that they need to do their job. They're, they're held accountable for being CEOs. They don't call it that, but they don't have what they need to do their job. So what was really, what I'm passionate about is empowering um, clinical and non-clinical leaders, but especially nursing, um, because from my workforce management standpoint, it's the ter- toughest type of department to uh, to manage. It's a moving target, at least in the acute care side, you don't always know what you're going to get. So um, it, the, the target uh, for productivity and the way the budgets work, you're allocated so much, so many staffing hours per unit of workload. Well, their workload's always changing and um, it, it's hard to react to, reflex to, and be on budget. And workforce accounts for 50, I've seen as high as 72, 73% of total operating expense for a hospital. So it, it, with just a little bit of coaching and the tools that you need to do your job, um, a 1% improvement on a billion dollar hospital budget is pretty significant, right? So that's my angle with staff the edge. I've spent the, the day job was the, uh, I've been consulting for about 10 years, uh, focused on margin improvement, whether that's cost containment, revenue growth, uh, patient throughput, quality outcomes, employee engagement. The subject matter that I get pulled in a lot on is, is workforce management. For Stock TX, do you guys focus mostly on hospitals, efficiency in hospitals, or is this something that... Um, you would like you would be able to work with maybe home health agencies, um, research facilities, yeah, small you know, private practices. Things like yeah, that. that's a great that's a great question. I mean, we we have a we have a few verticals for us. Um, the primary would be acute care. Um, that's where StaffDX started. We just got done wrapping up an ambulatory surgical center um, version of StaffDX. And um, ironically, in the productivity space, for healthcare, if you look at it, home health and ambulatory surgery are very similar from a productivity standpoint. They have some different functionalities that they'd like to have, but 95% of it's actually the same. You kind of had two different types of departments in any any healthcare organization, department, or cohort. The first is... I have patients and that's my, the patients that come in are my unit of workload, right? And uh, so for example, a med surgical department, um, they have 20 patients in the department and for each patient, they get nine hours of staffing. It's pretty straightforward. The other type of department is a procedural based department. So um, the OR, interventional radiology, um, they do different types of procedures that had that are more or less laborious than the other. So varying degrees of investment of resources uh, from a productivity standpoint. And so mathematically and um, how you monitor and the tools you need to manage, they're slightly different. Um, and so we just wrapped that up for ASCs and home health. And then we have a, another vertical, which is um, like a, a business to business strategic partnership as well. So another thing I wanted to ask you, since uh, we're mostly, obviously we're doing this for the students, but would you advise any student that is probably uh, looking to start a business in healthcare? First piece of advice um, I give would probably be, um, uh, one, be patient, (laughs) be very patient, Um, at least on the acute care side, really all in healthcare. It takes healthcare leaders a long time to make a decision. On, on your product or another. Um, so be patient. Of course, we're going through this season of COVID and um, that's even a greater distraction for getting your offering in front of decision makers. Um, another thing, another lens to look at patients through is in healthcare, <clears throat> in my experience, the networking, it, you may have to demo or sell your offering multiple times before you actually get to the decision maker. Um, now, ahead of, ahead of that, that's, that's on the premise that you have an offering. Um, probably more important than that is uh, your offering needs to meet the need where the user is at, right? So 
Um, you, your solution needs to address a problem or a challenge that is real and meets them where they are, if that makes sense. Um, it's gotta be a real solution. There are plenty of things out there in the marketplace with bells and whistles and colors, and but the users don't, you can ask any nurse, uh, how many applications do they actually use? And then ask their executive, how many do they have access to? Two, two very, very different numbers um, because there's a lot that's pushed down on them that it just doesn't offer the functionality that they need. Lots of times because the product or the offering is not actually created by somebody who understands what their challenges are. And I guess third, I would say, um, surround yourself or, or partner your, partner with people or organizations that uh, improve you or uh, build build you up or uh, add value to you or your product or offering. I can't I can't I can't uh, overstate that enough. Do you feel that before anyone should start a business in healthcare, do you think it's required that they actually spend some time working in healthcare, or do you think that someone can just graduate from college or even not finish college and start on their business idea right there? Yeah, that's kind of a tough question. My, my natural reaction would be cut your teeth, get in there and learn at least what's going on. Um, in any profession, when you leave school, you really don't know what's going on. And, and that's not discredit to school. It's just uh, in, in academia, it's just um, in, in the real world, it's a little bit different, right? And um, it, learning what the idiosyncrasies are of the industry and, and really a big component of that is the people, right? The people, the people de build, define, change what the processes in a healthcare setting are and um, books aren't written as quick as things change in healthcare. So I, I just, you know, now, you know, I do know of some people that have come out of school and um, one I'm thinking of in particular, a guy named Spencer Jones, entrepreneur. He was an RN, um, but he he did do some, he actually did do some time in, in healthcare, like in hospitals, different settings. So um, but I don't think he was there long and he, he latched onto an idea. He saw a need that um, he built upon uh, and his company is called Linnaeus Medical and they're going to market right now. It, it, we'll be lucky if we get to ride in his G5 plane, you know, in, in five years. I don't know if there's any last piece of advice or anything you would give to anyone who's looking to start a business or a career in healthcare at all? Yeah, I, I'd say uh, one, probably be very humble and listen to what people tell you. Um, not all of it is always going to be relevant, but always listen, right? So um, I'll give you an example. We started going to market when COVID hit, which at first, it was like a, this horrible delay. We thought it was going to be the end before it started. And um, but StatDX was in a different place then. And we started doing demos and we kept pushing forward. And StatDX now looks like a completely different animal than it used to. Um, we have added and enhanced so much functionality that adds more value to end users um, just because of those demos where people would say, you know, could, could it do this? Could we, could you change this? And, and we took that feedback and we did it right. Um, now, when I say be humble, also be determined. Um, you know, if, if you're passionate about something and you believe in it, then, then push forward with it. I, you know, there, there's a difference between taking feedback and then believing if someone says, you know, you're barking up the wrong tree, you can't do it. So be confident in what you believe and, and push forward. You don't ever fail. You just, you learn. And, you know, a lot of this stuff I'm probably saying sounds like uh, it would be in an office, like, uh, you know, be confident with a picture of stars or something. Um, but it's real. It's, it's very real. Um, the other thing, you know, be flexible and open to changing your strategy. So when I first started, um, I, I didn't want to have anything to do with investors. I'm an engineer. I'm, I, I don't know if I even consider myself an entrepreneur. I just, I had an idea and I wanted to make it happen. And um, I, I wanted to wholly own the company. Uh, I, di I didn't want to seek out VC or private equity. 
But there's a lot of benefit in VC and private equity, and it gives you scalability. Um, it's kind of like um, my CFO challenged me. He's like, do you want do you want 100% of a cherry? Do you want 50% of a watermelon? So when it comes to ownership um, and, and the investors that invest in you and your product, when they're pro predominantly investing in you, to be honest, um, they bring a wealth to the table. Not only uh, they bring a network, they bring cash, obviously, um, and, and they bring influence. And so I'm not trying to focus so much on VC or PE, but um, be flexible to change because I'm 180 degrees out from where I started. Did you experience any major hurdles when you are seeking financing? I mean, we're early in the process now. We have one investor and um, they, they just kind of jumped on. So I, I didn't see a lot of hurdles there. Um, you're you're going to have to do some things that maybe are uncomfortable. And I'm, I'm not saying um, that would challenge your integrity or anything like that, but it may expose an area of weakness for you. I'll, I'll be perfectly transparent. There are things that I have had to learn and um, accept, learn, and, and, and leverage to, to move forward with investors and, um, and that, that are maybe not my skill set, right? So surround yourself self with people that build you up and help what you're trying to, you know, where you, it's important to understand who you are and where your weaknesses are, right? And then you build your team around filling those holes that are in your game, right? And, um, and people that, and, and be comfortable with being challenged by those, those people. COVID is uh, definitely a hurdle. <laughs> I'm sure COVID was a hurdle. Uh, so COVID, when COVID hit, what were some of the major things that kind of, I don't know, ruined or delayed a lot of the launch time? So there was an immediate, essentially an immediate like shutdown on um, vended services and consulting. Um, just the, the struggle was just getting people's attentions. So what we did was we pivoted and instead of trying to go directly to a hospital or ASC, we started looking at B2B partners that, that we were interested in that we thought um, we had a complimentary, we could have a complimentary strategic relationship. Um, so, uh, for example, well, we're, we started talking to Health Carousel, which is the largest uh, national provider for agency nursing, and, and they're in the process of uh, taking a total talent management service line to market. And um, you know, we we started talking to surgical care affiliates, which has like 250 plus surgical care uh, ambulatory surgery centers. Um, uh, we started talking to HST Pathways which is a provider for health tech for uh, clinics and ASCs so that we could get in front of them and share the, what we thought the value was, our value proposition was to them and how they could use it. And then we, we knew that we were going to come out of COVID. Um, we, you know, we're still coming out of it, but we're getting much more attention now because we'd already built those relationships up and, um, you know, networked. So we, we leveraged the, our, our resolution to the networking problem with healthcare organizations was to network with businesses during the COVID time. So I remember you did say that um, after COVID, or actually just now compared to when you first started this business, it's a completely different organism. Um, so what did it look like in the beginning? It was much more stripped down. Um, it was um, it had foundational utilities. But as we um, explored the different cohorts of healthcare, home health, um, ASCs, um, acute even more, when we get in front of them, it, it's just always be taking notes. And so we added some, some functionality and some apps within the solution that um, just didn't exist. I'm mean, just, you know, the kind of like, if you can dream it, you can build it kind of thing. I've got a developer that can build anything. I mean, he, and he, he, I think his expertise is understanding what I'm saying in my ideas. I'm a process person. I'm, I'm not a tech guy, um, but he under, he can listen to me and then translate that into a solution that's automated. So we started leveraging more automatic email text functionality. You know, we're all, we're all tied to one of these. And um, so how do we incorporate that? Um, 
we started exploring, this is a space I, I, I was kind of foreign to me is user interface, user experience. Um, you know, how, how, counting how many clicks it takes to accomplish this task in the solution, the look and feel and the different user groups and stakeholders, uh, they go, would go into StackDX for a different purpose. So how do you re completely redesign the software, the look and feel of it so that it accommodates each state, each user group's needs? Um, so it lo looks very, very, very different. It was very foundational in the beginning. Thank you so much for this. I know I kept you a little longer than I thought I was going to, and then I just started asking more questions. But, oh, no, it's fine. Um, <laughs> things just came up, man. I just found some more <laughs> interesting angles. But anyway, uh, thank you so much. This is, I think this has been really valuable for students. And if, if I can do anything for you and your, your audience in the future, please let me know. I'd love to help. I will. I will definitely let you know. I'll keep you in mind. And also, if anybody wants to reach out to you and ask questions or anything like that, where can they do that? So they can go to um, staffdx.com, S-T-A-F-F, D as in David, X as in x-ray.com. And there's a, a, a member uh, a form, a contact us form at I think the last tab and it'll it'll come directly to me or my colleagues. Um, they can email me at hello at staffdx.com. Um, they can DM me in my LinkedIn. Uh, we have a staffdx LinkedIn as well as so they can go to my personal one and DM me there. Um, yeah, so I, I, I welcome I welcome any opportunity to talk to your students. All right, perfect. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Alan. Thank you, Ashley. Thank <laughs> you.